No, the switches will kill the switch. We'll see how it goes. You want to last me. A couple of minutes after eight, we're going to get started here. All right. Simmer down. We have one big rule here, and that is one pool at a time. Yes. We are all fools, so we can talk anytime we want. The rest of you. Be quiet. And that means. Uh, let's see, we have one other rule, and that is that we do not insult anybody here personally or their mothers. So their ideas are fair game, but not their mothers or their persons. Okay. Uh, beyond that, we have an agenda. We start off with announcements. How many people here have announcements tonight? Of events or whatever. One, two, three, four. Hi, Ernie. Um, yes. Um, and after the announcements, we hear from our speaker, Peter Paro, tonight. And he'll be telling us about the Cuban connection and uh, the politics, the economics, the uh, social implications, and cultural. Uh, connection. Okay, and without any further ado, then we will hear about the Cuba connection from Peter Perro. Bienvenidos a todos a Cuba y Havana. So welcome to everyone. I told us about uh, this little tour of Cuba. Uh, it started for me uh, this spring, and uh, I'll go back, and there I am. Uh, you know, uh, one more adjustment, because I know the contrast is not too great in the back. Turn the lights. No, 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 don't do that. There's a so we got a switch back there. There's a switch back there. I think if we... I don't know if it'd be better or worse. Someone try. Uh, oh, that's fine. That's good. Uh, leave bad enough for me. Right? Yeah. Uh, I got the notion to see uh, probably the last communist country in the world remaining coherently. So, and I won't count China any longer. So, I decided to see Cuba for myself. And there are three ways you can go. You can go as a, an educator, you can go as an artist, or you can go with a religious group. Those are the three conditions now to get you in. You can't go as a fisherman or a casino uh, fanatic. Uh, you have to have three good academic reasons to be in Cuba or to get a visa under uh, State Department rules. And I was going to pass one around as to how it looks. When you finally get your travel affidavit, this is what it looks like uh, from the State Department. But you have to have a legitimate reason. So as a teacher and as a CPS teacher, I decided I go down with uh, high school teachers from across the country. And. Uh, what happens is you, uh, of course, most go to Jose Marti Airport in Havana, and they put us on some what I thought were reliable buses. I found out they were not that reliable as we got on the road and traveled. Um, they look very new and fresh, but I'll tell you later about Chinese buses, because Cuba likes to trade steel with Russia and uh, China for hard goods, and the buses were not that reliable. I was kind of hoping it was a GM or Chrysler bus, because the U.S. needs the help. But when I got there, one of the first sites, and I'll start this as a kind of travel log with these pictures, and then get into the issues during the Q&A. Thank you very much. I hope, I hope I can pull some of my politics out of it, but this is, uh, 
Revolution Square, and you probably recognize uh, Che. And uh, right, Victoria Siempre, hasta Victoria Siempre, always, always victory. Uh, che was pretty ardent. Che was, I think, more extreme or more political than Fidel. And Fidel sometimes was a more practical man. And Che, of course, met his death in Bolivia being not so practical, being uh, an idealist for the revolution. So, in Revolution Square, there are rallies, especially May 1st, and Fidel's birthday, and so on, so on. And right here is the U.S. Embassy on the other side of Revolution Square. U.S. Embassy. U.S. Embassy is here, and here's the guard in the blockhouse. So remember these flagpoles, because to my surprise, the other side is the embassy. Uh, lost something there. Well, let me get back to that. The other side is the U.S. compound. And they were taking pictures from the U.S. compound onto Revolution Square. And so the government got tired of the telephoto floor, uh, out the windows of the embassy, U.S. Embassy, so they put this forest of flags between Revolution Square and the embassy. And another story is that there were signs in the embassy windows saying, you know, no people move up. So to block the signs and the cameras, they put these flags of the nation between the Revolution it's actually Square right now. Just give it a second. The embassy. This, it looks a little, little austere to me and a little, a little forbidding. Um, it's the Russian embassy. So before Putin, there was lots of traffic to the Russian embassy, uh, doing lots of trade business. Um, when when uh, Moscow was a great ally of Havana. But now not so much traffic and not so much trade. But it looks pretty forbidding to me. It looks like a perverted Disney World uh, building there. It's a watch Yeah. Also, yeah, I was thinking, boy, embassies just don't look good any way you cut it anymore. Uh, they're very paranoid. They built it so that Khrushchev could keep an eye on Fidel. Do you know that place? <coughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Oh, the Russian. All right. One of um, Cuba's big exports, in addition to, I happen to bring this cafecito here, how the coffee freeze dried, giving vultures a run in Maxwell House. But, of course, is tobacco. And uh, this fella is uh, rolled a few that he wanted us to buy uh, when we got off the bus. And he said, you know, I've got plenty of cigars to make at home. But we knew we couldn't get many home through, through uh, what is that, tobacco, firearms, and... Alcohol, alcohol tobacco, and yeah, firearms. Yeah, tobacco, and firearms. Yeah. Strange bedfellows. How did alcohol, tobacco, and firearms get put in the same department? It's all victimless crimes. Yeah. 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 Medical marijuana. He dropped the fire. So he um, showed us how he uh, harvested uh, tobacco. And uh, of course, you know, sugar cane is another exportable crop, and nickel is an important one. And nickel more so than sugar anymore. <laughs> because nickel is something the Chinese want very, very much for industry, for manufacturing. But let me get back to the uh, finca here, or the hacienda here. Um, he was showing us how he cures and rolls the tobacco. And on the side, he is permitted to sell to tourists under the new fresh wind of uh, Raul Castro who's saying businesses on the side are allowed as long as they don't compete with the state. So he was not only working with the state to give tours, but he was also selling something on the side. Where was that? This is uh, outside of Havana, about, about an hour out on the Chinese bus. 
So we're still traveling at this point. We're still on the road. Okay, I travel a lot. <laughs> uh, one of the tourists, one of the teachers said, could I try this product before I buy one? And he said, sure, I'll let you test this. And, and she took one back to the hotel. I think there's a limit as to how many you can bring in the U.S.? Five or something? That way you're not trafficking. If you're bringing boxes of them, you're trafficking. And that's not allowed. In the same with a case or more of rum, you'd be trafficking. So there's a limit as to how much you can bring back to Miami. Or guess what? There's flights from New York now and L.A. Direct. And Chicago. Uh, no, we had to go to Miami. Uh, I don't know of one. Cubana uh, Airline, direct from Chicago, yet. Yet. There are three cities that opened under Obama's administration, and that's New York, LA, and Miami. Direct. Direct. Um, he showed us his backyard, and he had the old Chevy parked in the back. <coughs> It's 57, or no, even earlier, 53. Chevy? An old, old dog here in the corner. Look at this. Uh, Tim, did you happen to bring a wand? Uh, a laser beam? No. I'll have to use the old finger. Hey, he was wealthy enough to have a piano in the parlor. <coughs> and uh, there was no misgiving about, I found, uh, Christian symbols. I didn't see any dissuasion of that. Uh, in the state bus, there was a rosary hanging from the window, and here at this farm, he had this Christ photo in it. So this idea that communist Cuba crushes, oh, you happen to have one for you. This is made in China. No. no. <laughs> this idea of crushing religion, I just did not see. In fact, on Sunday, the church church in the square was open. So a couple of churches opened. Uh, that may be an issue in China, but not in Cuba. So the bus parked, and uh, we saw all these Europeans here biking around for health, like Bob Matter. They were biking around, <laughs> enjoying uh, the country, countryside. And I'm on a bus like a whisk here, and uh, didn't, didn't take a bike or a, or a horse, but we were on the tobacco farm there. Uh, paella is big, if you know, if you've eaten out in, uh, oh, on Irving Park Road, we see, or on Fullerton, there's several, a uh, new chain called, uh, Sur, Cubana Sur, what was that called? Yeah. Senor, Senor Pan. Senor Pan. There's actually a chain trying itself out in America now called Senor Pan, Mr. Bread. And they've got standard sandwiches, formulaic kind of stuff that you can get uh, from Cuba now. So it's not in Cuba yet, but it's come to America. Senor Pan, Fullerton and uh, around Pulaski. This is paella they were serving up, which is a seafood medley. And more surf and turf kind of things from their yards were uh, uh, chicken, lobster, and rice for about the U.S. equivalent of 12 bucks. And we were amazed at that. And uh, they have their own uh, brand of cerveza called Bocanero. Bocanero. And, uh, Gee, how many people in this room have been there? I know there's someone in the back of the room. Oh my God. Bob Steve can tell us. Cuba. To Cuba. All right. So this was a new, a new reform where you can have a restaurant in your home. You can have one of your kitchen, a kitchen, a room in your home and serve uh, tourists because locals couldn't afford it. And. Uh, as long as it doesn't compete with state restaurants, you're allowed to make that money uh, for your employees. And you, of course, got to report it. Of course, you have to report the income to the state. But that's a new fresh win in Cuba, that idea of home restaurants. Uh, public housing. <coughs> what, um, 
fairly clean and refreshing for me. I saw no graffiti, and uh, this, these were blocks or public blocks. Uh, no, no, no uh, washing washers or dryers, but of course you could hang your wash up on the line, as most people did in in Havana and in villages. And uh, in the bad old days. Maybe good for America, but not so good for Cuba, were these casinos. And this one still stands, and uh, Lucky Luciano, who was a gambling king from U.S., had built up this resort, and, and, and Meyer Lansky was his partner. And so this was one of the many uh, gambling casinos that Castro took down as soon as the revolution took hold in 1959. It's now apartment housing. But the sign is still there, the Riviera. So, you know, you hear the clubs, Copacabana, those kinds of things. Now it's state <coughs> Copacabana still has performances. Tropicana. Tropicana, I'm sorry. Tro Tropicana. Yeah. Were you there before Castro or after? Both. Both? Wow, you got to take the mic when, when it's your turn there. Tell us. Pre-revolution and post-revolution. There is a story about, these are from the Pan American Games, they had a stadium, and it's pretty beaten up now as much public architecture is falling to ruins. But um, don't let me forget the story of when uh, Castro came into the casinos. I, I hope I don't forget that. But this is one of those buses I wanted to tell you about. It just doesn't have the horsepower to make the hills. And at one point, we had to push the damn thing. <laughs> and because it wouldn't turn over. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. You were kidding. And I got out of it because I took the picture. <laughs> so I wasn't pushing. So that's how the but buses the, are. The guide was pushing. And these other teachers from California <laughs> and Phoenix pushing the damn thing to get a jump start. And he threw it into gear, and sure enough, we got a jump start downhill. So you talk about China as a manufacturing powerhouse, but they don't make great buses. And I think GMAC made a better bus. And as I was talking about earlier, Here's the uh, rosary I happened to see on this state, state bus. And, you know, there's no danger to him to display that sort of thing. And here's the Cuban, I mean the uh, Chinese, uh, this visor here. Let me know that it was Cuban-made bus. Chinese. Chinese. Chinese bus. Now remember, Cuba doesn't make an automobile. So, you know, they, they, they used to um, import Russian vehicles first, but now you see more Korean vehicles through a trade agreement, but you won't get a new American vehicle um, into the country. And I'll talk more about that during the political, political part. Right now we're still traveling. But modes of transit. Am I too loud there? No, you're fine. You can see, you can also. Taxis, of course, more expensive. and. Not for the everyday traveler, but this is one of those <coughs> popular Russian cars called the Lata. <laughs> L-A-T-A. Almost as bad as those tour buses. Because they were, they were always forever breaking down and it was hard to um, maintain the car. But there's a lot of them left, uh, pre-Putin or pre-Gorbachev, that are still being maintained. <laughs> yeah, already he's got that oil leak. Good guys. So here I am in silhouette, uh, taking the picture again. Uh, windows open. Crime was not did not seem to be a big issue as we might think in Chicago. So someone would park and leave their windows open. Oh, who would steal that? Uh, yeah, hey, <laughs> that's no prize, is it? Newer, this newer van, though, would be a prize, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, you don't, um, this would be a public bus for a worker on his way to wherever, to a, a shop or a 
state-owned store, and they were usually packed. Oh my goodness, they were packed, and maybe maybe about a, a twenty-five cent equivalent U.S. to to the bus. Um, but then these are well-preserved um, pre-revolution vehicles, and this was a Chevy. I don't know the date. Maybe Bernie would know. He's a Early 50s, yeah. before 53. 55. It's like a 51 or a 52. Yeah, yeah I agree. How do you know? What's the clue? It's a guy thing. Yeah, it's a guy thing. Yeah. I don't know. So, uh, this was a taxi, so for four or five dollar US equivalent, you could get a ride in a convertible. Uh, Tropicana days. Tropicana days. Hard top. Hard top version. Bad sleep, isn't it? Streamlined. No. No, you're right. That's bad can of spray paint, isn't it? No gloss. But um, he's got his his chrome. What do we call them? Spinners or? Oh, uh, yeah, but kids on the street call them my, my... Rims. Rims. Yeah. Rims. I got my rims. You gotta have rims. Yeah, he got the rims in the front, but he just didn't quite make no, it. No, I never... Yeah, I think it was Plymouth or Studebaker. Plymouth. All right, product of Kenosha, Wisconsin. It used to be. Now, for the really economical... Uh, taxi. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of a deal on the taxi there. Um, unibody. Monococcus, they'd say, or you could flip this whole uh, is that a Yugo? coach no. up. I don't know. If this no. is Coco. I don't know if it's. No, not Yugo style. That wouldn't hold up. I would say maybe Asian made. Uh, and you, know, you flip this thing up and you get to the motor here. It's a three wheeler. So you put two passengers in the back for a couple of days, and you've got shelter from the sun. Now, for the really economical... Where is that made? I don't know where that was made. I should have asked the driver, but I didn't take a ride on it. I just stayed on that Chinese tour. Um, for the really economical, okay, take the family, the church crowd, you pile them on in the back, kids on the lap, and the driver pedals. <laughs> this architecture is in pretty good shape, but many things had um, uh, sca what do you call <coughs> scaffolding to catch the brick and the uh, stucco that was evolved from colonial times. All right, I did see one piece of graffiti that probably was out of place. I thought, is this as bad as you can get? That's it? Shut this smiling character here, and uh, I don't know, that was sprayed on to something. And that was the worst I could find. Uh, all right, if you needed uh, some Chinese food, there was a, there's always Chinese everywhere. Go to Eastern Europe, and there'll be some family cooking Chinese there. And then some cell calls could be made. For a buck. No, not a dollar store, but you could call Canada for two dollars a minute. And I understand that's about what it costs, about three dollars a minute for the Cuban to make a call with a cell phone, which are seen and permitted, but you're going through state satellites when you make your call. I can get into that further, but um, you're going through state communication systems when you send email at the post office and such. And in some ways, we're no worse or no better off. Uh, I'll make that point later, don't let me look at that either. I want to talk about my Yahoo experience because I was here a couple of months ago putting down Yahoo Hotmail and their, um, their reconnaissance too that we do here. In such in such so-called phrases communications. But anyway, um, music. The Cubans have this joie de vivre for their culture and their music. And kids were 
practicing their percussion here as a parent volunteer. Of course, we had to visit the schools. That was a big reason for going. Uh, so we visited this middle school, junior high, and uh, I'll see more schools later. But uh, this was a lunchtime uh, show uh, on the street, and uh, I quite enjoyed that. And uh, I don't know when these fellows came out in the 90s, early 90s. Well, we did a social club. Okay, a lot longer. I mean, pre Castro. Some of these characters are pre pre Castro, and some have passed away. But a uh, folk artist named Ry Cooter, U.S. artist Ry Cooter, found these guys performing in uh, Havana, especially the originals here. I think he was in his 80s, and Cooter put them on film and made them a big hit in America. And then they had a hit tape, this one of his uh, social club, with, uh, I think a film that yeah. went along with it. So there's still a big thing there. 50 years, Buena Vista Social Club, there's still a celebrated uh, junta, as they say, or a junta. Uh, I'm not sure what this was. You read into it what you will. God is making women. Uh, or dismembering. It's a no, he's putting no. it together. Chilly thing. Oh, I like your positivity. I like your positivity, okay? Complete, complete. Make a partner In process, yeah. Okay, in process. We have self-assembly in the assembly line. Uh, like that. And uh, if you know something about Santa Ria, Santa Ria is a little bit like um, Haitian uh, religion, but it's got more Christianity mixed than, than, the voodoo, than the voodoo idea. So you have, sometimes you see sacrifices, a <coughs> uh, chicken head will be cut, or um, she's reading a palm. And I love her colorful clothes and her head headpiece. Uh, for a tourist, of course, who was, uh, you know, there were Brits and there were Canadians and there were Germans on uh, oh. the road. I happen to be with American uh, teachers. All right, Papa, you all recognize. America's favorite son. No, America's favorite son. Ernest Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway. As far as letters, <laughs> Chicago's favorite son. As far as letters, Oak Park. Uh, Oak Park was the boyhood home, but they say he was born in Cicero. So Cicero people get very angry when they say, "Oh, he was born in Oak Park." Say, no, 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 more humble. Okay. Right, the old man in the sea, we'll, we'll, we'll get a, a picture of that. Um, but, uh, there he is. Okay, I wanted to talk about Hemingway when Fidel took over. They had some pretty good conversations. And there was no question about uh, Papa having to leave or Ernest Hemingway having to leave. Uh, he could go on with his fishing and uh, he was quite a hero to Cuban people because he put Cuba on the map. So he and Castro had a conversation after the revolution. And uh, yeah, I gotta cut that so my own so I'm being watched. Uh, um, there is a story about uh, Fidel coming into the casino after the takeover, after Bautista was overthrown and the workers were very quiet in their white jackets, and what's going to happen to us? What's Fidel going to do? And he or ordered an orange soda at the bar. That was step one. And then he said, everybody keep your jobs. You're now working for the state, and you'll get your wages, and uh, any profits will go back to the state. So everyone breathed a sigh of relief, like, oh, we're not going to lose our job. We can keep it. He said, it'll be a hotel now, and we'll no longer be a gambling casino. Those were those early conversations when people weren't sure what's he going to do and what's, what uh, will the Communist Party do post-revolution. So, of course, casino owners had already left for Florida, and uh, the workers stayed and ran the rooms and kept their jobs. And his home, 
And if you've been to Florida, you know, you know uh, Hemingway's home in, uh, what's that? Uh, Key West. Yeah, Key West with cats. Well, there were a lot of cats there, too. And I had to go in. I was just thrilled to uh, take a look at the big game on the wall. And, uh, you know, water buffalo and some things that... Uh, Ernest uh, Hemingway loved her, from whom the belt, um, uh, no, 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 the African belt. The snows of Kilimanjaro. The of Kilimanjaro. I think. Brought that to mind when I looked at the mementos. And um, the home is pretty well preserved as it was when Hemingway and his wife lived there. One of his wives uh, stayed with him there. And, uh, and the antelope on the wall, and you could just hear the, the man rock drinking his rum and smoking his cigar. Pretty well preserved. Twin beds, I was surprised. You know, the guy's got a reputation in the lady, but there's twin beds he's got there, and I don't know what the movie projector was. It's an old uh, film strip projector, or a slide projector there. Slide projection. Remember Kodak, Edgar Crumb? Yeah. Uh, I even, you know, talk about detail. I thought, oh, the bidet. I've got to take a shot of the porcelain. Uh, talk about when you have too much rum, you pray to the porcelain god at night. But, you know, the sea motif there. Uh, the antelope beyond the house. I don't think you can export or import those kinds of things anymore. Uh, those uh, animal skins or animal heads. Uh, his collection, all, all hardcover, not a paperback on the shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, real collector. My wife Young is here and she always buys first, uh, first edition, uh, hardcover. She won't put a paperback on the shelf. Uh, that's right. That's right. In my room, it's all paperback. You are fine. All right. There really was an old man of the sea who Hemingway knew. So he takes his picture here. It's a rather powerful black and white image. And in paint, we see Gregorio there with his uh, Havana or his... Uh, oh, there's so many. There's so many brands. What are some of the brands? Uh, Fuent Carlos Fuentes, uh, Jack Kennedy like to smoke those uh, long Cuban cigars. Monte Cristo. Uh, Monte Cristos, and uh, just couldn't get them after the embargo. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't get them uh, back in the States. See, he could uh, get Kennedy had his source, but... Uh, you know, the common smoker can't get those Monte Cristos. Yeah, Spencer Tracy. Yeah. Was he in the movie, Old Man? Yeah, yeah he was. Yeah, the old man. Old man, man. Old man in the sea? Yeah. He was the old Oh, all right. He changed. Oh, yeah. And having white chatting at the bar, and uh, I don't know. She reminded me of that woman in I Love Lucy, but I don't know. Uh, you no? Is that having his wife? Not very that would be the event? Well, then I don't know. Quite the party crowd. Quite the party. Now, this is before, before the revolution. Oscar Levin, perhaps? I don't know. No, okay. Cesar Romero? I don't know. I'm in a grand old time. Before the, before the revolution. There he is, Nelson Rockefeller. Well, um, one way, and my friend Jim in the back, he talks about how in his country they would, right, Jim, they would uh, grind the sugar cane. Grind the sugar cane to make a nice drink. Or chew on that, or chew on that for kids who want a sweet treat. And it's organic, you know? It's not, it's not gum, it's not Hershey, it's the real deal when you uh, want a sugar lift, and, and nature too, you get, uh, here's the pipe, here's the pipe, and uh, you get your sugar drink that way. 
I suppose you could do the same with pineapple or peach. So he was making a bit of change for himself, which is not outlawed anymore to make side money. Uh, this obrero, this trabajador, uh, he was taking a rest later, and he got in a wheelbarrow, and I just wanted to capture that. <laughs> a siesta. A siesta. And uh, whatever they have, and they sure do. And we went to this castle to climb up here and see this Spanish fortress, but I said, is that a tool shed or, uh, for a uh, power, uh, uh, like a ride lawnmower? He said, are you kidding? We don't have riding lawnmowers. He said, a guy lives there. I said, no, oh, come on. Can I go? And everyone was getting on the bus, but I just had to see if a guy could be living there. So sure enough, I looked through the doors, and he was living there. Oh, yes. And um, I said, ¿Dónde está el baño? And he said, well, you go to the park if you want to Thank you, sir. relieve yourself. And uh, he, he had his wine, he had his chips, he was having a good time, he was reading the paper, and he seemed pretty relaxed, and uh, the state let him stay in that hovel before before the castle there. And I thought, in the, you know, in the U.S., we'd clear all that out, we wouldn't want that in view. Maybe he does our jobs, but that was his home. <coughs> So Cuba is not saying, oh, you know, we have to hide it all. Um, there were people hurting, no, no question, and that was all visible. Uh, said, go ahead, shoot that picture. So, uh, by the way, she was a prostitute on the street, and uh, Cuba cannot cannot say no. Uh, so. You know, I said, can I take your picture? May I do that? And she said, yeah, yeah, go ahead, take a picture. Uh, Cuba wasn't hiding its dark side, I found. Uh, and yet, we didn't see evidence of gangs. We didn't see evidence of graffiti, heavy graffiti. Uh, we saw patrol police on foot or bicycle, at most uh, motorcycle. And this is the capital city, so uh, they just didn't have the seem to have the crime worries uh, that I could see. But then I was there like eight or nine days, so that I'll give you that isn't enough time to learn. Maybe some of you have been there three, four times. Anybody more than a month? Yeah, more than a month. Were you collecting botany specimens or fishing? Going for a wedding in Spain. In Spain, a month. Take the mic. You be here. Well, our mission was school, so we went to see an elementary, the escuela, and these kids were pretty wonderful. I enjoyed seeing them in their classroom, third, third fourth, fifth grade, uh, mulatos. I mean, um, the uh, mixed blood in Cuba is is not not a ghettoized thing where you go into the poorest area and there's going to be dark people or there's going to be, you know, everyone was mixed and proud of their Afro-Cuban blood. It didn't seem to be to me uh, that's there. They live here, but we look like this. We live here. It was a, I thought, a healthy mixture of everyone everywhere, especially in the music, Afro-Cuban rhythm, Afro-Cuban cuisine. And uh, so, okay, even the dreadlocks. They had, uh, by the way, if you were in, and I couldn't quite catch the hierarchy, but there were blue scarves and red scarves. And I think the red scarves were more of those pioneer. Remember the Russian pioneer? Yeah, pioneers. The Russian pioneers were like the Boy Scouts. The young pioneers. Young pioneers. Yeah. So they had the red, they were the pioneers, and the blue is some other level. And are we going back to that? So many uh, Chicago schools have gone back to uniforms. Uh, not like that, but uh, white top, black bottom, four boys and girls, white top, blouse, whatever, black. 
and not so much the uh, rock and roll local. But, as another story, we'll leave for a future college of complex. Yeah, um, I noticed that in Cuba, um, kids were sitting a lot waiting for their teacher, and the idea in Cuba, according to Professor Sao, she said that in many countries you sit down when it's line up. But in the U.S., it's like everybody stand up, line up, we're going, we're going to recess. They would sit down and line up. And when everyone was silent, then the teachers would go on with where we're going to go, what we're going to do. So they were on a little field trip. So just over their heads is uh, anniversary, 53 years. Uh, I believe he's about 85 now, Castro? Something like that. 86. Uh, 86. No. Whatever, depending on what year he was born. Specialist. No, I don't think he made that no. up uh, about his birthday. But his brother Raul now seems to have party control, but Raul's in his late 70s, getting to be mid to late 70s, and also has infirmer in, infirm conditions. So both of them are tottering a little bit. And yeah. Fidel had to give up, he's sort of shaky and had to give up power, uh, yet he still advises the party. Uh, got to see a secundaria, which is high school. Can anyone translate that? It's hard to see, but it's something like that. Especially with that thing. I, this I don't understand. The, the school is going to provide you with the mind to work the, the, the future of your life. Oh. Faena is work. It's, it's the same like work. Faena. Faena. He said, a place of trabajo, I would say. So, yeah. or, or a career, a vocation. <coughs> no, no. Uh, for your life. In, the, in life, you you have to struggle, right? Uh, and that's faena. That's faena. Continuous. But oh, your mind the... will help you to I deal guess. with it. Equip your mind for the struggle of life, yes. Jose Marti. Was kind of the Thomas Jefferson of uh, Cuba, Jose Marti. And they still have Radio Marti, that's the public radio station. So I got to see a high school, all open air, California style. You know, where you come out on the patio and you eat lunch, and California style. Uh, it's a security issue in the U.S. now, you know, we can't let them off the ground. we got to put high fences around these California schools now. A big security risk in our paranoid culture. Here, go where you want, you know. Eat, come back, go to class. Uh, so they were in uh, vocational or trade class. And I got to say, this wouldn't happen in the U.S. They'd have those hats on, those hard hats, because they were building something, some sort of framework. They were actually trying to build out a room as a model in the trade school. And here they are working with pipe, and they're bending pipe, and they had uh, saws and things, and they didn't have protective... Uh, I gear. So I thought, oh my goodness, we're, we're, we're so concerned here about liability. We have these kids all masked and jacketed. And, you know, we'd be very, very cautious here in the U.S. about that. Uh, I thought they were pretty lax, really. I thought, where's the teacher? Oh my God. And there was one teacher in the whole room. That's all I saw. Uh, so, yeah. What, what, what do we have here, Frank? The revolution? It's uh, uh, <coughs> victorious and uh, the energy, you know, pushing ahead. Adelante, does that mean forward? Yeah, yeah, forward. yeah okay. continue. <laughs> right. right. And yet, when you think of the state of Cuba today, it's not pushing very forward. It's, it's quite stalled out uh, economically. There's a never-ending revolution. Uh, in the eyes of the party, yes. Uh, in the eyes of the young people, 
they're looking for talking about something else. Mm -hmm. About something else. They're not quite sure, but they think... Something other than revolution. Oh, they, they think the parents are still say, yes, sigue adelante. But the kids are thinking, maybe there's another way. Free market solution, we're open, we're interested. I'm not sure, you know, if they come here and really see it, instead of just watching movies, they know we've got problems. Mm -hmm. Miami isn't the solution to everything, as we know. <laughs> anyway, they let me in this, uh, there's Jose Marti, and they let me in this, uh, I, don't, I don't know how you say it, like CAPS. We call it CAPS here. Um, it's citizen, citizen Headquarters. Community Center. Okay. Maybe for the defense, what is it? Committee for the Defense of the Revolution? Yeah, that sort of thing is how it started. Your community center where politics go on, where you vote. Library was another thing. When I saw the library, I, I looked at the main books on the table, and most were in English. The new books they were showing off were in English or French. Um, I thought, oh, these are the, the leading books. Uh, and a lot of it was beaten up and paperback. How many Cuban kids uh, speak a foreign language? Oh, God. I didn't get stats on that. I didn't get stats on that. It's not, uh, yeah, Russian used to be the lingua franca, right? Yep, but yep, yep. Uh, you're not traveling much, so what are you going to use the English right. for? You know that? Except it is the second language. Well, sure, I mean, sure. You know, it's, it's come to be second language of the world, the global language of business. But after all, they're not about to get a business visa, that's for sure. Uh, unless the state approved you to have some sort of official business. However, they changed that recently. Well, <laughs> you know, if half your family is still in Cuba, you can go, you know, but remember there's sanctions. I don't think they're going to send everybody on a vacation visa. And the same the other way, too. You have to you know, state your business. Why are you here? Who do you know? What are you bringing? Uh, Vas bien Fidel, Revolution Square. So the last I'll finish with was something that captured my imagination called the Literacy volunteers or the literacy corps. Uh, alphabetization. How did you know? Yeah, there it is. There it is. Alphabetization. Yeah. And and they were sort of the Boy Scouts or the sharp troops of literacy. So they would wear these berets and they would go into the countryside, hence the uh, Coleman, the little stove, the little uh, lamps, and they would go into coffee plantation that would go into sugar plantations and bring books. And so this mural was to commemorate the men and women or boys and girls under 18 in some cases who had a high school degree or were studying in high school and in the summers they would go to the farms and bring books and teach literacy. And that's something Cuba is still very proud of, that they are 97% literate in Espanol, reading and writing in Espanol. And they also boast very high um, health care, I mean, uh, very healthy uh, free dental care, free medical. Their doctors in some specialties are envy to the world. Uh, they're exported for hard goods, I mean, not traded as a human, but saying, we will send these surgeons to to Colombia, and in exchange we want goods, our goods, and we are you know, exporting our talent, which isn't uh, uh, I was thinking of those horrible missiles, the drone missiles, you know, we're not selling that sort of thing, we're selling our intelligence. We're not selling Boeing or uh, Lockheed or Martin Marietta products. We're selling sugar cane. We're exporting coffee. We're exporting uh, our intelligence, brain power, doctors, teachers. They do a pretty, pretty good job on that. This last shot, if I can believe this piece, they said was 
a blackboard um, in one of the country schools that was sabotaged and that these bullet holes came from the back, from a window, into the chalkboard. So they sprayed over the chalk and they saved the board, saying Socialismo, uh, El Cuba, and showed the, you know, some of these propaganda things and shovels, and uh, that was the story about that. So I end with this oil painting um, that was downtown, and I thought, if, if touched my heart that this was the Havana I got a chance to see, um, thanks to the Cuban people and the uh, Cubana Airlines. I uh, had a pretty good exposure to what a socialist country feels like and what a communist country still looks like. Um, and I think Cuba's a survivor. So that's all I can say and take your question. Are you done now with the projector? Are you done with the projector? Yeah, right. we don't want to overheat that. All right. Gene Horker has a question. Right. I'll get it. Hang on. Gene's question. Uh, yeah, the, one of the ladies that works at my building uh, on the desk, she's married to uh, a guy from Cuba. And she went to Cuba and she seemed to feel or indicate that there were kind of spies walking around on the street. Did you see anything like that? Of course, of course it would be tough for me to spot. All I could see were uniformed um, officers on bikes, men and women, motorcycles. I'm sure there's a heavy hand of the state, though, that if you're a suspected person, as, as the state would define that, you, you are well being watched. If you're trying to break out of the system, try something underground and you haven't sanctioned that with the state, you could be watched. Just as you could hear um, when the summit was in town, right? There was heavy hand. When was there. that? What year? Yeah, where, when were you there, Gene? I, I wasn't there. This lady who was on the, uh, who works at my building, oh, on the desk, within the, the desk. year mm -hmm. or a year and a half, she, uh, her husband was, I guess, Cuban, and she went to when? Cuba. When? When? Recently? Yeah, within a year and a half. Oh, okay. Yeah, within a year and a half. Oh, did the, um, did the visa get back to everybody? Oh, okay. I'll pass some money, too. What the heck? <laughs> Another question? Don Ritchie? Yeah, I got a question. How long is it going to be before those, those, those tyrant Castros are overthrown and Cuba can become a free country once again. Mm. You know, I'm trying to be balanced what about this. I had to see it for myself. It wasn't until 1959. Um, I don't care for family rule anywhere. And I, you know, that, that's an oligarchy. I don't care for family rule. Um, I don't know. Uh, one party state also seems limiting but the convictions and the ideals were there. I think U.S. had a big part in strangling uh, what they thought would be the progress of the revolution. And you can do that internally to yourself, so you can have it done to you. We haven't done a good enough job of it. That's all I can say. Well, because they're still in power. We Castro is passing. Cut out for us. And it's rumored that <laughs> certainly when Raul is gone. They yeah, yeah, right. think that a more progressive wing of the party will get control or do some reforms after the Castros have gone. And, and I think then the U.S. State Department is willing to talk more seriously about normalization. But it's a tough question, and I kept searching myself for that as I walked around. Nobody said after 5 o'clock I had to be locked in a hotel. They said, Go where you want. Take a taxi. Do it. Take a bus. So I didn't feel a heavy hand, or that someone was watching me in the hotel or just telling me where to go. All right, Ken. Yeah. Of all places, I read an article in the National Geographic that talked about there being a dual money system in Cuba. Uh, 
could you address how that works? Because it seemed like the one system was based on entrepreneurship and tourism and uh, related to the dollar, and the other was the old system. Very unusual dual currency. I didn't know what to make of that. Euros were okay to bring in because euros were looked on as neutral currency. But let's talk about that. If U.S. brought in a bag of money, I mean, if you brought a bag of money and you throw dollars around, you could really cripple that economy. You could really throw your way oh, in ways you can't imagine, from bribes to everyone catering to the Americans. So what you have to do is cash your dollars. You have to change your dollars for what's called CUC or convertible currency. And one one let's say peso, one, one convertible, one CUC is equal to one U.S. dollar. Now you can leave the airport and spend it. But that's a, a way of cash control, and I think Russia had something like that, didn't they? There was tourist money and then there was Russian money. And, uh, you know, making change is another problem, too. <laughs> because then am I going to get peso or am I going to get CUCs back? So one guy in the street was selling newspapers and gum, and it said, uh, you know, one, one, with dollar sign, or one, one piece of paper. So I gave him my CUC, and he was really shocked. I thought, wow, oh sure, here, take this gum. And my friend said, you just spent a buck for a pack of gum, this guy's going to want to have dinner on you. He said, it's really worth one peso Cuban, which is four cents. <laughs> but I thought, okay, you know, we do it every day with Cuba, so okay, he gets a buck back for a change in, you know, U.S. Cuba. Uh, uh, Turn around there, he made a buck. Yeah, Peter, did you go past the, uh, I don't know, what, what do they call it, the presidential palace or whatever the heck it is oh. that, that Raul or, or Castro lives in? I, no, we saw no palace for the president. Or none of that. We didn't. We saw museums. And we did not see any palatial gigs. Uh, Castro's supposed to be in a, in a more rural area, taking it easy because he's so infirm. Yeah, how how much was the hooker? So, <laughs> Jim <laughs> talked business, and I didn't want to talk business because Jim I didn't want to. Yeah. Uh, we couldn't even use ATM. There are no ATMs. There is no uh, credit card use. I mean, otherwise, Westerners would just buy in, cash in. I mean, they just take over. They really would. How do you control that? So, no, no ATMs. No traveler's checks. You change to CUCs. The way the state is watching the currency, the, the greenback. Uh, not a golden hammer. I think, yeah. Yeah. I, I have the privilege of having been to Cuba uh, a number of times, over 10. My wife, who researches there, has been well over 100 times. And I made a few notes um, as you were talking, and I think there's a couple of things that people would benefit from realizing. First of all, Cuba is a third world country. It makes no pretense at having the wealth of first world or second world countries in terms of the economy. Uh, they're poor. They're distributing what they have. Secondly, the United States, ever since 1960, has attempted to, actually for several hundred years, has attempted to own Cuba. Every single president of the United States has made reference to the fact that Cuba should be part of the United States because it's only 90 miles away. And since the revolution, they have made strenuous attempts to break Cuba. There have been well over a hundred attempts to kill uh, Fidel because he was the symbol of a new Cuba. And there are constant attempts at sabotage. So, of course, the Cubans are apprehensive. The third thing is that it is not possible, because of the U.S. Commerce Department, 
to purchase anything made in the United States, even if it was routed through Europe. So they're buying Chinese buses because they cannot buy anything from the U.S. And I'll give you an example. Wait, hold the example uh, question, because we have a time you, you have at time the college you where bought. you can give <coughs> your peace of mind. Yeah. At this it's point, not we're looking for questions. Facts. No, this yeah, is but, but, the the question period. but give us more of that information <coughs> right. when we line up. Okay, uh, somebody at the back. Yeah, I, um, I have a friend who did a documentary uh, for an organization called Community Solution. And there was a heavy emphasis on things like gardens on the roofs and, and in the outside of the windows and uh, buses and bicycling and all types of progressive energy conservation efforts. <coughs> especially since after um, Russia and the Soviet Union uh, got out, and that it's really a model for all types of efforts of energy. Is that correct? For those of you who are not familiar with our procedure, perhaps I should explain it a little more. Uh, during the question period, our remarks end with a question mark, <laughs> and uh, the, the speaker responds. Uh, afterwards, about 10 o'clock, we move into our rebuttal period, in which uh, we apportion the time so that uh, you, everybody can, uh, who has something to say can say it. Uh, Bernie Kahani has uh, his hand up for a question. I'll, I'll pass this money around, by the way. It's not greenback, it's a pink bag. Uh -huh. And I would be thrilled to see Jefferson cutting cane on a... Jefferson had a $10 bill? Yeah. Or Franklin on a hundred cutting cane. On this dollar uh, bill, a peso here, uh, it's Che Guevara cutting cane on the back. Because at harvest time, everybody had to come out and help. So here he is on the money, and it was hard as heck to get this, because the CUC doesn't put this propaganda on money. So I had to keep asking drivers, give me change in Cuban money. So that's what's on the Cuban money. Pass that around. It's a lot of fun. Go ahead. Did you have your cell phone with you? And if you did, did it work in Cuba? It wouldn't work because... The state uh, controls the satellites, and the satellites are old Russian equipment. So it'd be very hard for my cell phone to work. And uh, I do want to say something about that because there's so much talk about well under a free American system. You know, you can call anywhere, anytime. Um, I sent email to someone the other day, and Yahoo blocked it. And and I had to say. Because everyone was complaining on the bus trip, you know, you couldn't use cell phones here and it would cost you so much, you have to go to the post office and use a cell phone. That's not free speech. Here, here's my message. Suspicious activity was detected on your account, Mr. Perro. To protect your account and those of other users, your message was not sent. Okay? There were hypertext or words in the Yahoo that came from someone and Yahoo decided I shouldn't read it or answer it. If that, if that kept up, because the second page of that when I resent said, if this correspondence continues, your usage on Yahoo will be suspended. I was pretty damn shocked. And yet, you know, if they wanted, didn't like the language I was using and decided to tell Hotmail about it, or Yahoo decided to tell Gmail about it, I suppose I could be thrown off the internet. So are we, are we that far away? If we use language that's not friendly to, not our state, but to these corporations, they can take the net from me too. I really thought long and hard about that, and um, I thought, yeah, the state owns it in Cuba, and there's three or four carriers that own that in the U.S. too. If they ever get together, they can limit the words I use or the words you use in your email. 
but okay. that's why I went to think about those things. Um, okay, Tim. What uh, specifically with with the cars? I know they got the '57 oh, Chevys cars. and the Lavas mm -hmm. and everything else. What are some of the later makes and models that you saw? Korean? You mean newer? Newer ones, yes. Korean Korean vehicles. They must have a trade agreement. I don't mean with the North Korea. I mean with South Korea. You're talking about like Kias and Hyundai's. And and Hyundai's and, and Chinese trucks and Chinese heavy duty. From from the probably Shenzhen Motors or so, something. I wish we had a partnership on that. <laughs> I wish we had some sort of partnership with that. But somebody said earlier, nothing comes out, nothing goes in. Bernie, didn't you get a question? Yeah, I did. I have another one. All right, Bernie. Um, they, oh, give the first timers a chance. Yes, when you hey. were when you were in Cuba, did you go? But did they take you past the Bay of Pigs? No, I did not see the Bay of Pigs. We did go to some farm area. That's how we saw the tobacco field. But and no, I did not see. And two, they didn't take it, take you past any of the missile sites either. Uh, <laughs> No, I'd rather not talk about that. No, I, uh, <coughs> I think that there was a missile monument. Yeah, there was a museum of the revolution, and they had some missiles, the ones that got Russia in hot water, and they had some MiG fighters in there under a roof, and uh, it was all glassed in like our Smithsonian air and space. So I saw a missile there. And I'm sure they've got a defense network, um, but it's archaic. Like we said, third world country. I see low level technology. I don't, uh, I think uh, Iran has more for us to worry about right now. Or um, uh, North Korea has more technology that we should be paying attention to than Cuba that, that can't even get the bus to go downhill without a push. Okay, so buses are not a priority. Uh, Mike Foley. Yeah, I, I'm one of those people who believe that Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, Raul, and the whole Cuban Revolution was all run by the Central Intelligence Agency, <laughs> uh, and that actually that whole regime in Cuba and the Cuban government, Fidel, they're all they're all lackeys of the American Empire. And, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. That would be hard to prove. I, 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 well, I agree. I agree. I got no absolutely no evidence. Yeah. Thought. I mean, I mean, why, why? Well, first place. Why kill? Why of um, Che? Why try to attempt assassination of Cuba if they uh, Castro if they're working? I don't believe they ever tried to attempt to assassinate Castro because he's still alive. Yeah. The other yeah. Man said that right. there was a hundred assassination attempts. attempts. That just is impossible. The United States, when the United States tries to assassinate somebody, the guy is dead they in get that state. Just like he's Diem and his life. brother in Vietnam. Diem and his brother are still dead. The United States wanted to assassinate him, and they killed him dead, and they're still dead. Oh, in fact, Fidel is still alive. I've seen the information on the Diem regime, yeah, yeah. on that, and Kennedy knowing. And but, the reason is Fidel's been spying on Russia. Yeah. And everybody in Latin America who hates America would try to get to Fidel and say, oh, Fidel is wonderful. He's like drawing out people who hate the United States and showing us who our enemies are. This is rebuttal. This is a question period. Yeah, come and take a chair after on that, if you believe it, <laughs> the conspiracy theory. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry, I came in late. I just wonder, uh, are they still high? Highly promoting communism ideology or uh, education people with that. So or? you saw the posters in the school. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, our schools don't do much with nationalism anymore. We, we, I, I don't know why uh, our schools, our schools don't. The pledge is optional. I mean, elementary schools do it. High schools don't do it. It's amazing that. Our schools don't propagandize. There's barely a thing on a post office wall anymore, and yet, yet there's a, a virulent strain of, of other patriotism. I'm not sure where it comes from, um, but it sure keeps us in 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 war for for years and years and years. And uh, I have to wonder what we think we're defending sometimes. But they seem to know what they're defending. Viva la Revolución! Remember 1959. Generally, people are sympathetic but they're tired. 
and the country is broke. So you can say it's uh, from external force or you can say it's from a party within. But the people are tired and as he said, the third world nation right now is still struggling. Is it suffocating or killing itself? Or being suffocated? That's a question with a question. Go ahead. Hmm. Tony Paul. Comment on uh, Castro's offer after 9-11 to send doctors to help the victims of uh, oh, really? trade towers. Mm. <laughs> we don't need their help. Yeah. It's funny how pride overcomes. Uh, yeah. And there was offers during uh, Katrina. Yes. Oh, no, we don't need help. We don't need your help. That's right. And you know, when Japan had an earthquake, I remember U.S. saying, we'll send our Red Cross and we'll help in Japan. We don't need your help. <laughs> and they were at that period of, of economic dominance. They were at a zenith. And, no, we don't need your help. No, thank you. And it's, it's some kind of political pride that uh, prevents us from helping one another when push comes to shove, and I, I think we should think about that. I know Cuba Chavez offered uh, low-cost energy for the people of Chicago in the form of heating oil. No, 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 thank you, we don't need That's that. That's right, and New York. That's just a political problem. Um, you know, Citco is their company. Go ahead. All right. Uh, in Venezuela. Victor Philip Chavez. Finally. Victor, finally, you're that. I understand that uh, Cuba sent about 30,000 doctors to yeah. Venezuela, Venezuela. Uh, in, a, in exchange for petroleum, I guess, for their services. I mean, 30,000. Uh, this country couldn't send that many at one time. Wow. <laughs> uh, uh, one thing, supposedly, uh, maybe you can corroborate because you're in the education field. Is it true that now, before the rule, uh, after the revolution, even a peasant's daughter or son could go to a med school or can achieve a higher education. But before the revolution, they, there wasn't a, a chance for them to go anyplace. Class Did you feel any of that thing that there was more equality in education? I, I think it's a tremendous um, great power, but it, it's sort of pent up in application. Where do they go? What do they do? After they've taken care of their 10 million people and done the dental work and done the preventative care, what do they do next? Well, we've got human capital here. Let's export this. We can't make a vehicle, we can't make an automobile, but let's export what we have. Uh, hydroponic planting, you know, these, these gardens without much sunlight, hydroponic vegetables, this sort of thing, and herbal, herbal cures and medicine, pharmaceutical, some tremendous things. I'd be proud to think this is a great domestic product. Great domestic product. Francisco? Yeah, uh, as far as Japan refusing for help in the yeah. Fukushima, Fukushima, they refused. Uh, oh yeah, during the nuclear meltdown, mm -hmm. the oh, tsunami again tsunami. refused. I was thinking in the 90s when Nagasaki was hit by an earthquake and we said we'd send over help and Japan said no, thank you. So what we went into a period of that uh, uh, filled with enough water. Is that an extra uh, one, though, is it? Oh, God. 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 Oh, God.
You know, there's also, um, as long as we're on the economic issue, there's also a state has stipends. Um, whether you work very hard or, and that's a criticism, uh, whether you work very hard or work not, not much at all, um, you still get a stipend, but it's the equivalent of about 75 bucks a month. That's going to come to you, but that's not enough anymore to live on. And this is the thing. Now, now the state's saying, this is all we can give each man, woman, child. Um, but you've got to get out and do something for yourself. So that might be leasing some state land and growing, growing your own vegetables and selling these things on your off day on Saturday or Sunday. So these little enterprises are being allowed because 75 a month is no longer enough. Also, the ration book is still in effect for rice, milk, bread. And once you're off your ration book, that's all you get for the month. So you've got to improvise as long as you're not taking profit that the state doesn't know. So it's state-managed enterprise, I suppose you would call it. They're turning to that and trying that out. Whereas under Castro, that wasn't done under Fidel. So is, is a stipend available regardless of a person's income? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every man, woman, and child has the stipend. Well, not child, of course, you're feeding a child. But I remember a journalist from the Atlantic magazine, he went to Cuba to see if he could live on the 75. He changed his U.S. currency. He got uh, Cuban pesos. <coughs> and he could not make it even to half the month being as economical as he could drinking tea or hot water, uh, canned tuna fish, crackers. He couldn't make it to the middle of the month. His 75 was blown. And he had to wonder, well, then what are people being forced to do for the rest of the month? And prostitution is one of those things? Or selling things on the side? Well, it's not expected that they would live on that, is it? I mean, it's like... Well, of course. Well, of course, how goods cost. You start with getting a job. I mean, I mean let's... Let's talk about the fact that the, the gum was like four cents for that pack of gum that I bought. They're not giving the stipends for these people to live on, are they? Yes, they are. Supplement. Yeah, yes, that's they what are. I was supplement. supplement. Yeah, supplement. But under Fidel, no, that was are. supposed yes. to take yes. care yes. of you um, after the revolution, that from each according to his ability and to each according to his needs. I mean, yeah. Now, it's so costly. And the cost of oil since 1959, just think about that, powering things. So it's turned them to be innovative, yeah, for survival. Somebody brought that up, about transit, to survive. If that's all you've got, then you're going to find a way to bike to work, and you're going to find... I mean, that's, those are the economics of state-managed uh, economy in Cuba. I wanted to ask a political question. Now that we have a that would be different. Now that we have a, a second term of President Obama, do you think there's an opening for more open relationships between Cuba and the United States? Uh, I would hope there's a normalization. I call it a normalization, just like I could get on a plane to Puerto Rico. And I think Cuba in time will look a lot more like Puerto Rico, honest, honestly, where if you want to go to the Holiday Inn, you go to the Holiday Inn in Puerto Rico. I think that's coming after the Castros. I think it's coming because America is looking for markets, outlets, and enterprise. And they're going to find Cuba, and they're going to change their ways. The US will. And I think the Cubans will say, we're, we're out of ideas. And, Invite American entrepreneurs. You know, I have. A I hope that can be managed, though, step by step. Yeah. I've got a question. I remember uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Governor Ryan uh, uh, went to Cuba. Oh yeah. Yes. Uh, George. George Ryan. Yes. Uh, he. I think he was looking for an end to the embargo on Cuban sugar. Uh, for the benefit of the uh, confectioners and uh, candy makers. Uh, well, or, or, but uh, what uh, uh, 
Archer Daniel didn't, didn't like that because they were selling a lot of uh, corn, high fructose corn syrup. And, uh, oh well, what, what is the politics of that? It's called trade missions where the governors want to sell. Archer Daniel Midland and Conagra want to sell more product, but the Congress has ideas of their own. You have to let the Congress in on these trade deals. Uh, so sometimes we're willing to buy and they're willing uh, to sell and they're willing to buy, but we've got to have the Congress bless these things, State Department. So it's political. All right. Tim Bolger hasn't had much to say. Um, I'd like to know what your opinion is. Do you think the revolution in Cuba was beneficial ultimately towards the Cuban people or would Cuba today be better off without the Cuban Revolution? Young people today, under 21, would probably say we'd be better without restrictions. And people who knew the hard times under Bautista say Fidel good did good things. But you know, when you have a short memory, you want to try other things, you want to get into market culture, and, and look what Russia has done, look what Poland has done, look what the Czechs have done, and not always for their own good, because now the house of cards has fallen, so, uh, but young people want to try, they want to try difference, they want to try something new, whatever you can't do, you want to try when you're young, go ahead, Barry. Norman has a question, yeah. Have you had a chance to meet Doc and Miami Cuba to get their point of view? Okay. And yeah, what do you think of that? I wish. I should have. But we just blew through Miami and got on the plane to Chicago. But next time I go to Tampa, I should ask. It's so easy to find a Cuban restaurant, which means talk to the manager and ask him. And they're a very tough lobby, and they've got a long memory. And the Miami Cuban lobby just won't forget. They want to repatriate, they want their, their lands back, and they want to, you know, ride back into Cuba victorious again and retake the country and all of that sort of thing. Freedom. But they're damn old now, and, uh, you know, the ones who left in 59, my God. So I was thinking, what do we get? We got two things that people remember. What? Two media images we get, we, we're still left with about Cuba. Ricky Ricardo, remember that? Uh, yeah. Ricky Ricardo. And um, now Tony Montana. If anybody's seen... Scarface. Scarface with Al Pacino. You're forgetting the biggest one, which is DX. character. DXers Unlimited. Exorcist? DXers Unlimited. DXers are Cubano? No, no. DX Unlimited. One of the most popular programs on Radio Havana, Cuba, propagating the ham radio hobby. Oh, DX Radio. DXers Unlimited, the program's called. All right. I have not seen that. But, but this uh, Pacino thing has become a cult, and I, I really despise that as much as I do mafia for Italian. For my, my people, you know, these mafia posters. Uh, what about Ben Trevino? But, oh, Ben is in the back. Yeah, Trevino. Uh, actually, I have three questions. Very They're pretty easy. Uh, how much was your trip? One. Oh, yeah. Uh, how surprised were you by actually the people that, they actually seemed pretty damn happy. And, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't really feel as impressive as you would think. And two, how often did they try to rip you off? And I mean, everybody, especially oh. all retailers, any retailer. Ben has been there several times, so he knows Cuba. Um, and I didn't feel ripped off, no, I felt safe. Um, I'm not saying but safe, I'm just saying. I mean, try safe. To rip you off. Yeah, um, but there was always. Uh, I remember Phil in the Opera House. Now, the security at the Opera House should have been tight, and he said, if you buy my CD, I'll give you a tour at night after it's closed. <laughs> so I said, well, I'll buy the CD when you give me the tour. So, and, and then I had to leave the hotel, and another teacher came with me, and sure enough, he was in 
in the uh, back door where he told me to come. He's taking me into the state opera house. He could lose his job for that. But he was so desperate to sell the CD, of course, we each bought the CD, and he's taking us to the back tour. And I don't think there'd be security people who would risk their jobs here. They're so frightened here. Uh, there's no stipend here once you have uh, 26 weeks of unemployment. But, you know, uh, people would be very afraid to lose their job here, to take you into the Lyric Opera after 11 at night. So he's taking me around. So there are scams and schemes mainly to sell you something private. Say, so, yeah, I made this thing, would you buy this thing? Hey, come over here, are you American? Would you buy this thing? Um, I didn't feel like someone was going to hit me on the head, though, or rub, rub me. What was your other part of the question? How much, uh, how much was the trip itself? Oh, um, it was $1,500 $1, to the Cuban tourist office, of course, um, split with an agency in Canada. So I'm on the phone to Toronto to get my ticket, my room and board for $1,500. And of course, they're sharing that with Cuban state officials because they have to drive the bus, they have to arrange the meals, the hotels are state run. So maybe the agency got 400 in in Canada. and. Uh, Cuba got uh, a thousand bucks from it. Oh, and then I had to fly on my own, and that was uh, 700 more to fly. I was lucky enough to get that. How long were you there? So, Chicago, Miami, and then down. So, How long? Eight days, uh, courtesy of the state, uh, hotels, and buses, and schools, and hospitals, and uh, those were open to us. And at nighttime, anything we would wonder to. There were some discos, a couple of things, you know, that were nightlife, where a drink was like equivalent of two US, maybe. I'm sure they were fully licensed and paying a lot to operate to the state. <clears throat> so. Let's go to rebuttals. Yeah. Go to rebuttals. Oh, wait a second. Bernie, did you still have a question? Uh, I guys know a lot. understood that uh, going to Cuba is kind of like going to a time warp yeah. in the U.S. with regards to uh, some of the cars and some of the uh, public transit you see there. Is that true? Yeah, those buses were pretty rickety and, and uh, those, those Chevys with the top down were a, a blast. But there's, the class system rears its head, doesn't it? You're packed in a bus that look, looks like a school bus if you're a common laborer. If you've got a little money for a wedding or something, you've got a top-down Chevy. And so, just like here, right? You either take CTA or you take a taxi. It's money-based. So, I think the rations and the state stipend are the two things that are truly communistic or socialistic, and of course the free health care, which, which we're getting in 2014 uh, <laughs> to some degree, tax, tax funded. All right, uh, Mark, Mark 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 you, you mentioned the uh, refugees, but they're the reason for the much criticized embargo. They are the ones that pushed it, and the rest of the world thinks we're terrible, and I think oh. so too. But it's because they that. are a special, strong special interest group that has... Oh, the uh, expats yeah. Yeah, in Miami. Yes. They yes. want an embargo. Florida. They yeah. want no yeah. trade. And that's Starve right. out Castro. That's, I mean, that's correct. They're the ones that have pushed this. Am I correct? They're a pretty strong lobby. Yeah. And they have influence with the Republican election. They throw their money in the directions. They come. But you know, how much is external, how much is it not learning a lesson internally? And I'll stand on that new point of neutrality. Cuba has had time to change, but hasn't changed very quickly. And U.S. has had plenty of progressive ideas, but haven't implemented them toward Cuba a bit. We normalized, we tried to normalize with so many other countries, but we've got this block about Cuba. Yes. All right. Um, the Let's go to rebuttals, Brown. Yeah, we'll move to rebuttals. Of, of Mike Foley has a question. 
I just want to, you mentioned these people in South Florida, a lot of older people, they want to go back to Cuba and this and that. Why don't they just go? I mean, what would happen to them? They just, I mean, there's got to be, we might have to go to Mexico or Brazil or something. Oh, no. Then go back to Cuba. Why don't they just go back to Cuba? Not until Castro's overthrown. The state has their land, so what would you get? An apartment, but the state has their productive land. Well, tough luck. I mean, if, if they want to go back to Cuba so bad, why don't they just go back to Cuba? They want to go back to a Cuba of 1959, more or less. With <coughs> Did anybody ownership. tell them that 1959 was a long time ago? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, okay. all right. In that case, we will move to our rebuttal period. How many people have opinions of regarding... Thank our speaker. Take a bow. Take a bow. Uh, one. Uh, raise your hands, please. For, for rebuttals. One, four, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is that all? Yeah, okay. all right. About five minutes each. Five, Brahma, right. about, about uh, five minutes. We should have plenty of time. Each. You got five minutes. Fifty-nine minutes. Uh, oh, but who is going to keep the time? You. You. Oh. Who's dead? Yeah. All right. Six. <laughs> 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 now the uh, microphone is permanently located. What? Um. I would like to make a comparison, first of all, with the uh, people from Puerto Rico and the people from Cuba. Los Puerto Ricanos no hablan español, hablan español. Sí. Los cubanos no hablan español, hablan erro. In other words, it takes, they take the ends and the essence out of most of their words in Cuba. Uh, in Puerto Rico, they just drop the essence. Everything else is fine. It took me almost 10 days to be able to completely understand my, uh, the people in Cuba when we were there. Marge and I were there in um, about 15 years ago. And uh, we went for uh, the, the wedding of a friend of ours who had met uh, a Cuban woman, uh, Alison Garcia, uh, at a conference of uh, communist youth. And uh, they found each other quite attractive, decided to get married, and we all went to Cuba for the wedding. Uh, they didn't get married. <laughs> Tough break. Um, but we, we saw a lot. We were there for a long time. Uh, at the time, the exchange rate with the American dollar was 40 to 1. And when we got off the plane, we went to Montreal in Cuba, in, uh, in Canada, in order to get to Cuba, because you couldn't fly there in, in, in the 90s. Uh, and we came back by way of Mexico City. But um, the exchange rate, they told us at the airport, you had to spend American dollars. If you were Canadian, if you were Spanish, if you were German, you had to spend American dollars for everything. And that was okay with us because we had American dollars. Um, the climate was just incredible. This was in December and January. Um, during the winter months, uh, the, you get onshore winds uh, during the night uh, and then offshore winds during the, uh, the daytime. So it's, it's beautiful weather there uh, most of the time in, in those two months anyhow. Um, the medical expertise of the Cuban medical establishment is just incredible. Uh, they, they do have specialists, but their, their general practitioners are already specialists. They, 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 uh, they may specialize in ophthalmology or osteopathy or something like that, but they, they all have a very, very broad uh, picture of the, of the medical practice, and they're, they're really good. Um, one of the things that we, we, we traveled, we uh, landed in the Baradero, which is a, a sand spit leading off into the uh, Caribbean. Uh, it was, it's a resort community. Most of Cuba's income at that time was from European tourists. They would come to Cuba. Beautiful weather, winter time in Europe, why not go to Cuba? It's cheap. And, uh, and they did by the thousands. 
And it was only in that month of December when the Cuban government began to permit prostitution because there were so many European tourists that were coming at that time. So they, uh, they let that happen. Um, we uh, traveled throughout Havana, uh, the, the environment there. We also went um, to one of some of the eastern cities. I've forgotten the name of it right now. But uh, we stayed, pardon? Santiago. Santiago. Very good. Um, uh, we, we, we stayed in an albergo, a, a, a little inn on San Juan Hill, which is where Teddy Roosevelt uh, yeah. rode up and uh, conquered, uh, tried to conquer Cuba at the time. No, he went up on well, Kettle Hill. He got photographs. <laughs> yes. But, uh, the, the, there was a, a colored regiment uh, that actually <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was uh, is that Pershing's 10th Cavalry? Yes. Now, on the subject of buses, uh, when we were there, uh, the last remaining Hungarian buses were still operating. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the end of the Russian influence, the, uh, the Soviet influence in Hungary and other Eastern European countries uh, had ended, and the amount of time uh, left between that time and the time we were there, the buses had been... Um, dismantled to make other buses. Uh, and uh, we, we had pictures. Marge has, is a great photographer. And she has pictures of rush hour, people hanging on the outside of the buses, people, huge crowds waiting for the next bus to come. And they would literally be hanging on the outside of the buses. It was marvelous. <laughs> Uh, as far as people showing the back, the back of uh, the <coughs> building, I was uh, given a tour of the old Edgewater Hotel by an employee, and they were in danger of losing their job. But uh, if you grease it a little bit, that was fine. Uh, so if you want to see the back of the Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires, you buy a CD from a guy who's selling them, and you see the back of the Teatro Colón. And if you want to see the back of the House of Representatives, you do the same thing. So I don't think that it's any different in Cuba or anywhere else. Um, as far as to our uh, self-centered ideology, <coughs> and with privileged position, uh, Eduardo Galeano <coughs> spoke at uh, Harvard not long ago, and he explained how the United States, England, France, and so on, treat the Latin American countries. And he said that a friend of his is a chef of a big, big restaurant, beautiful, uh, very high-level restaurant. And so he cooked a lot of ducks and chickens and, and, and turkeys and so he decided to ask the birds how do you want to be cooked in a tomato sauce or garlic sauce or, and of course you know when these birds debate the issue they say well we don't want to be cooked at all at all well that's not in the agenda <laughs> and uh, if you think that uh, Cuba is doing something controlling there. In Buenos Aires now, you cannot deposit dollars if you are an Argentine citizen unless you give your passport, unless you give a uh, registered statement, <coughs> uh, legalized statement, where did you get the money, and, uh, and, and so on and so on. I gave some money to my sister when I was there. She couldn't deposit it. They were asking all these questions. They, the, the, the person in the window is, is demanding all these signatures and things. Uh, Argentina, as, as uh, you will know, is in the hands of ADM and, and Monsanto and all that. And they're stripping the country blind. And so that's how we live so well in here, in spite of our totally horrendous administration of our wealth and our workers and everything else. Uh, that China does some good uh, production or something, I know that they don't because they, we bought some Chinese lace 
and the thing falls apart when it's running, you know. They were horrible things. No, 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 no manufacturing knowledge or, or way. Now, if they improved, like the Japanese at one point, they were very bad at what they did, but eventually they become very good. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Lights was the company in Germany that was made the best lenses, the best uh, telescopes, and then Canon came about, and, uh, and they do as good or better than any other company in the world. So the Japanese learn, and the Chinese will learn. However, I think that the Japanese will collapse before long. It will collapse ecologically, financially, socially, and politically. They are in the brink. And uh, not only my opinion, but the ambassador of China in Chicago agree with me that they are teetering into collapse. So, uh, China. What did I say? Oh no, the ambassador of China in Chicago agree with me that the situation in there is very, very different in China. Yes. And as you as you hear, this this I learned from the ambassador about two three months ago. I, I don't remember exactly the date. But as you know, the, the, the main guy in China is saying that if we don't correct the corruption and, and the whole thing, we are going to collapse not the, the party, but the government itself. So they know that it's coming. And the Jiangxi River, who, who feed the nutrients to the sea for the fisheries, doesn't reach the sea anymore. And the Yellow River, who reaches the sea, is so contaminated that it's polluting everything. They couldn't use the water for cultivation, for industry, for drinking, for nothing, and then dump it in the sea. So they are they are at a point that that the changes they have to do they are beyond China. They are the changes they have to do in their manufacturing, their economy. They are so uh, intense, so dense, so deep that they have to do it too fast, they couldn't do it, so it will be some rearrangement in there. Now, if you think that we are exempt here, well, you are for some surprises too. And uh, so we, we are exploiting the world, we exploited yeah. Cuba. Cuba was an entertainment uh, back room for the boys in the United States, screwing the young girls in there. And uh, you know the revolution put stop to that, and uh, I think that's good. They uh, educated the people. Uh, they are uh, they have a good health care. They have medical. Also in agriculture, they are way ahead of us. In agriculture, they are so far ahead that the Havana is the only city in the world that self supply their fruits and vegetables from the inside of the city. And that's because the knowledge of agriculture and how they apply it. So we, we have a lot to learn. Our bridges are collapsing for many, many years. Our roads are in bad disrepair. Our rails grow. I mean, our rails are really horrendous. We took some trains back and forth, and the trains have to go very slow because if you, if you accelerate, then the train is liable to, to derail from this shaking that they think. We, in Spain, you take the fast train, and you think you are in an airplane. It's going like a zzz, you know, it's just, it's just you, you can ride, you can read, you can do anything. Well, forget about here, because the rails are totally disrepaired. So how do we correct that? We are for an awakening here. We have a, a very dysfunctional economic system where money was made by changing money, manipulating money. That's not productive, man. If you think that's productive, because you are in a different world. Good call. Did you say well, Japan was going to collapse? No. Uh, first, you have to realize there's an embargo against Cuba. And it's been there almost since the revolution. So uh, not only embargo by the United States, but embargo by other capitalist countries. So what did Cuba do? It traded with the Eastern Bloc, 
the socialist bloc. And then the socialist bloc went down for different reasons. I won't go into that because it's very complicated. And um, what, what's happening in Cuba is they have to uh, more or less depend on tourists to a large degree. They, like he said, they sell nickel. And they also have a very big pharmaceutical industry. One of the biggest in Latin America. When you talk about Cuba, you can talk about it as a developed country. It's a third world country, very, very poor. And you have to compare it to places like Guatemala or Nicaragua or other countries like Colombia in the Central and parts of South America. And if you look at it like it's part of the United States or the uh, a type of system that we have here, like, like, uh, like he said, we exploit the rest of the world, and that's why we have the high standard of living. And now, what, what's happening here, we're going down the opposite way. We're uh, going down. The average person in the United States right now is making about ten dollars an hour and uh, we've lost the type of living standard that we have. Cuba never had that type of living standard and you can't compare it. But they have, like I said, a big pharmaceutical industry. They take care of all their people. They have free medical care. They're uh, pharmaceuticals that they do have don't cost very much, very little. So they're living a lot better than they did before. I was there when Batista was there. And people found bodies in the streets. People were fearful if they'd done any political activity at all, they would be butchered and found in the street the next day. The average uh, kid in Havana used to beg for a living used to sleep in the streets. Now they don't have to do that. They have a more or less secure living standard. It's very, very low, but you can't expect that much because it's not an industrial country. So what they're doing now is trying to feed themselves uh, through uh, their, own, their own land and produce more through their own land and they are trying some capitalist type of methods because these societies like China and Cuba are not really meant for socialism. Socialism is a type of society that's based on a very high standard of living and a high industrial base. And so it's, it has to have a hybrid type of economy and that's what it has and is trying to develop the capitalist side to push along the socialist side. But uh, what's happening now in the world, if you look at Greece, if you look at Spain, if you look at, uh, let's say, uh, other countries in Eastern Europe, they're all going down. And capitalism itself is starting to decay. And I think socialism is the next step in society. Um, no, no system lasts forever. Every system dies. We had, for instance, uh, slavery, feudalism, and now capitalism is starting to die, and it needs a higher form of development. And I think socialism is the next step. But uh, uh, right now in China, they're having this hybrid economy. It is developing very, very fast. As far as the industry is concerned, people brought that up. I think it's very interesting. China has a hybrid society, and, it, and, it, and capitalist countries like the United States invest very heavily in China and other countries. Now, they, they uh, make their products to, to certain specifications, and the specifications are brought about by the U.S. company or the European companies, they produce it this way. So they produce it 
in order to make a higher profit. So that's why a lot of the stuff that is exported is a low standard. It's mostly because of foreign ownership to a large degree. And that's one of the reasons. But it's capable of making its own uh, uh, products in a highly uh, developed way and a highly productive and uh, technical way. And it's doing that in a lot of its uh, assets. If you look at its buildings, if you look at its rails, rail system, if you look at the, uh, the, the air, the air the, their uh, aircrafts and things like that, it is developing. And I think it will get to a point where it will drop the capitalist side and develop into its socialist side. But it has to go through this different phase because it, it was a very poor country, one of the poorest countries in the world. And it's only had about 30 years or so, a little over 30 years, to develop its economy. The United States uh, developed its economy because it became imperialist and started to exploit other nations, and that's why we had a higher standard of living. But the higher standard of living only lasted about 50 years. I'm Michael Foley. First, I got to say a couple words about this recent election we had for president. I was wrong. I thought that by now this election would be in the courts, at least in the courts, and there would be street chaos with people counting votes here and there and people complaining they couldn't vote because power out of the East Coast and all. It didn't work out that way. About 10 or 11 o'clock on Tuesday night, the election was all over. Obama was the winner and that was that. Anyway, about Cuba, I really do believe that Fidel Castro and his whole crew are lackeys of the American empire. I believe that the American Empire runs everything from Texas all the way to South Pole. This country has been involved in all kind of wars and pending <coughs> revolutions and big revolutions, small revolutions. Dictators coming and going, democracies coming and going. We've been told our country's been involved in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Panama, El Salvador, San Salvador, every other Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua. Throw a dart at the map of Central and South America and the United States is involved in some kind of mobile BS to control and enslave the people and exploit them. The American empire really extends vast, far and wide, and I really think Cuba is part of it. You know, Castro has been spying on, the, on Russia the whole time he was in power, and like I said, everybody in Central and South America who hated the Americans would go try running to Cuba for help to somehow somehow do something bad to the United States and Fidel Castro would say, oh yeah, yeah, buddy, come on here, we'll take care of you. Next thing you know, Fidel Castro is calling up the CIA saying, here, Raul or Jose or whatever his name is, he's trying to cook up some kind of plot against the United States government. Next thing you know, Jose or Raul is dead. But anyway, the thing about the Bay of Pigs invasion, I think what happened there was I think the Cuban people from who these, these Cuban guys in South Florida were yelling and screaming about how the United States should invade Cuba and kick out Fidel Castro and all that. And they were a big pain in the ass. So President Kennedy said, Okay, anybody wants to go invade Cuba, just they round them up, the CIA sent them someplace in South America to train them for six months or something like that. Then these guys were sent an invasion force to invade Cuba. They were supposed to go invade Cuba and overthrow Castro and all that stuff. The CIA called up Cuba, Castro, and said, hey, they're training a bunch of guys to come and invade you. So when these guys got to the Bay of Pigs and were invading Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban army was waiting for them because the CIA told Fidel Castro they were coming and told to get the Cuban army ready to kill them. And these guys were sold down the river and sent to their death. And that took care of a big political pain in the ass in South Florida. And President Kennedy said to the rest of them, now you guys just shut up. We tried to invade Cuba and you guys screwed it up. That was the end of that. I think right now this guy in Venezuela, I think Hugo Chavez is his name. 
I think he's the guy that's taken over as far as being the big hate America guy in Central and South America. Vito Castro and his brother and all of them, they're over the hill, they're in retirement really. And Hugo Chavez is a guy cooking up trouble in all through Central and South America saying, we gotta go, the hated Yankees, the hated Americans, they're colonizing us, they're exploiting us. So everybody in Central and South America that hates the United States goes running to Venezuela and says, hey, Hugo Chavez, I wanna go do something bad to the United States. Hugo Chavez says, you stay right here, buddy. Next thing you know, Hugo Chavez is calling up the CIA telling him, I got another guy that wants to uh, invade the United States and do something bad to the United States. <laughs> That's the end of this guy. As far as conspiracies, I'm not going to take you a shot at you, sir, for calling me a conspiracy freak. But believe me, anytime somebody comes up with something that the ruling class don't want to hear, the ruling class says, oh, he's a conspiracy freak. Right. Our own government won't be, won't be a our own government tells us there's conspiracies all the time. In fact, I think it was Richard Nixon was called an unindicted co-conspirator for the water tank break in or something like that. There was some big shot guy, I'm almost certain it was a president. Some grand jury found a whole bunch of people as conspirators. And the president of the United States, I'm almost sure it was Nixon. They said he was a co-conspirator, but they didn't indict him or something like that. Also, right now, I don't know if it's a federal case or if it's a state in Pennsylvania. Right now, a state of, there's a people have been indicted for being involved in a conspiracy to cover up the sodomy of small children for 15 years at the University of Pennsylvania. Penn State. Sorry, you're right. I always, I always get that wrong. Penn State. You're right. But our own government, one way or another, the federal government or state government has said there was a conspiracy of high-level officials at Penn State University to cover up the sodomy of young boys. And so it's our own government telling us there's conspiracy here and conspiracy here. And also, as far as the murder of Martin Luther King, we told that guy James Earl Ray after he killed Martin Luther King, he went to England and back. He disappeared for about a year. He traveled to England and traveled back, and our own government told us he had absolutely no, 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 no help from anybody. So essentially, there's a conspiracy to cover up the fact that he had help. Because the guy was a broke-ass drifter, didn't have a dime in his pocket, and somehow he was able to live for a year traveling to England and back. And the other man who said, I don't know if he's still here, but the guy said that there was a hundred attempts to kill Fidel Castro, and it wasn't because if there was a hundred attempts, Fidel Castro would have been dead. The United States does not attempt to assassinate people. The United States assassinates people. Recently, we've had guys in Afghanistan get murdered. We've had guys in Afghanistan get murdered by airplanes flying around, shooting rockets at them when they're driving around. We've had guys getting murdered at weddings in Afghanistan by airplanes flying around with rockets, shooting at them. When the United States wants to murder somebody, they murder him, and the guy is dead, and he stays dead. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> well, first, I want to apologize for making a statement during the question period. I wasn't familiar with it. Second, I wanted to really express appreciation for your wanting to share your impression about Cuba because people know nothing about Cuba in this country in a large part. During the time that you were talking, uh, I made some notes of just information that I thought would supplement uh, some of the things you were saying. Uh, and that's all I really wanted to present, it's, it's just information. Uh, first of all, Cuba is not a communist nation, it's a, a socialist society. Uh, they aspire to supply everyone with everything they need, but no country <coughs> on earth at the present time can do that. Uh, second, Cuba has allocated the resource it does have in remarkably effective ways, so that the World Health Organization holds up Cuba as an example of national health. And likewise, their education system, as long as you can pass the, the exams, uh, it's free from kindergarten all the way through a doctoral program. Um, I think that 
people need to recognize that the political atmosphere between the United States and Cuba has for an immensely long period of time uh, been hostile. Cuba, Cubans are <coughs> fiercely nationalistic, very proud of their country. Uh, and I think that that is the underpinning of a lot of resistance in Cuba to the U.S. attempts and for a while success uh, in corrupting or changing what people live like in Cuba. <coughs> Cuba does have some resources. Uh, somebody mentioned nickel. Uh, Cuba has more than 50% of the world reserves of nickel. And if you're going to make high quality steel, you add nickel to it. Uh, there are, I mean, Chicago was one of the uh, cities that was authorized to have direct flights to Cuba, and, uh, but that's through a charter service essentially rented from uh, one of the big airlines. And for a while, and I, I think still at the present time, there's a flight to Havana. Uh, I, I don't know how that's being changed for the last month or so. I haven't really paid attention to it, but you could, you could a few months ago fly directly to Havana. Uh, most of my time has been spent in the eastern Cuba, in Santiago. Uh, eastern Cuba has a very, a somewhat different culture from western Cuba where in Havana. First of all, it is much more Afro-Cuban than most of the rest of Cuba because it was, that was where many slaves were brought in. Uh, somebody made a mention of the uh, Chinese in Cuba. They were imported directly to build uh, railroad and other facilities in Cuba, and they stayed. Uh, and it's not a, too much of a surprise. With regard to religion in Cuba, there, at no time since the revolution was religion suppressed. Um, in particular, however, uh, the Catholic Church was not friendly to the revolution um, and did uh, allow some activities which made it very hostile to the Cuban government. And even to this day, there's a great deal of suspicion uh, between some aspects of the uh, activities of the Catholic Church, but not Protestant. There are Jewish synagogues all over Cuba. Um, and religion by itself now has never been attempted to be repressed. Recently, like within the last 10 years, uh, the Cuban Communist Party decided that members could become, you could become a member of the Communist Party if, even if you were religious. And that had been true, uh, not true prior to that time. Uh, the use of private homes for both uh, hotels, that is, resident, you know, a lot, of, a lot of tourists to reside there, and also uh, there's for uh, cooking meals and serving, having small restaurants, uh, isn't quite as new as some of the other changes that were taken in the last few years. Uh, you could get a license for using your home as a, as a uh, hotel, whatever you want to call it, uh, and the licenses weren't cheap, but you could go ahead and do that. I know because I've stayed in private homes uh, on that basis a number of times. Um, some were comfortable and some were not. Mattresses are a different thing in Cuba <laughs> to some extent. Um, in Cuba, there has been up until now no internet connection. Uh, the only communication to the internet in Cuba was through satellites, which if any of you have ever gotten a satellite connection, is slow and it's very limited in capacity. AT&T had cable running from Florida to Cuba and the U.S. would not allow AT&T to connect up those cables. Recently, very recently, Venezuela has offered a fiber optic cable to Cuba. A French cable laying ship ran it 
it's already a bit, you know, in Cuba and they're in the process of connecting it up. Now even that resource is not infinite. Uh, and so how they'll allocate that, certainly the doctors, the medical uh, network, and within Cuba there is some communication. Uh, a side comment, Hemingway is fascinating to America uh, and very slightly to Cuba. It's not part of Cuban culture. Uh, the whole incidence of prostitution, uh, it bothered me too because I once got propositioned <coughs> in the 80s in Havana. Uh, it is not systematized, it is private. Uh, there are no pimps and they get smacked pretty hard if, they, if anybody attempts to use it commercially. But they have not uh, prevented individuals from deciding that I can get some American dollars that way. That's true also in the tourist industry. Uh, if you could get a job in the tourist industry, you made more in tips than a professor at the university or a doctor made because of, of that. Uh, and the issue of exchange, of foreign exchange, you could take dollars to Cuba and you could convert them but there was a, a, a 9 or 10 percent uh, penalty and that was after the U.S. took on the whole embargo situation. So Cuba some months or some years ago decided that the euro would be their base uh, exchange currency. Uh, and you can take Canadian dollars and euros down there and exchange them for, for exchangeable, you know, pesos. Cuba's pay paying internally in pesos, in Cuban pesos, is a problem that they're acutely aware of. Uh, as recently as five or six years ago, a friend of ours uh, in Santiago, who was a professor and head of a department at the university there, is making about fifteen dollars to twenty dollars a month in that uh, when converted, and that they are trying very hard to eliminate the Cuban peso for the exchangeable, the the euro equivalent peso, uh, but it's very hard to raise the salaries of all their professionals and so on up to a level comparable with what you would find in the first or second world country. So those are just some of the informational things that I noticed. Um, I would urge people, first of all, there is in Chicago, the Chicago Cuba Coalition, which can provide, and there's a website for it, um, a lot more information about what's happening in Cuba. Uh, and secondly, go down there and take a look for yourself. I went first in 1987. I walked all over Havana, talked to everybody, got invited in for coffee uh, in more places than you can imagine. Um, but since then, I've spent most of the time I have uh, in Santiago, where we have very close friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is very This is, um, yeah. Um, I was kind of reminded of, um, um, I don't know if how many of you ever heard of Sidney and Beatrice Webb. They um, went to Russia. British. What? British. Right. They were went to Russia after. Fabians. The, what? Yeah. They went to Russia after the Russian Revolution, <clears throat> and they were very impressed with how things were there. Uh, they they were thoroughly convinced that that Russia was the truly that 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 Russia was truly a utopia, and truly the workers' paradise, and even if things were not perfect. And, and clearly, the Bolsheviks were working for the betterment of the masses. And, betterment of the common man and they were building a better and, and far superior society to our decadent western bourgeois uh, uh, so-called democracies. Of course, the Webbs never got to see the gulags. And, um, and this reminds me a bit of this. I mean, you get the guided tour, you know, and you, you get to see what the government will allow you to see, but you don't get to see, you don't get to see uh, uh, the, the bad side of things so much. And um, I think one of the things, and um, now, 
Yeah. One of the things that, that, that you said, Peter, that isn't true, I, you said that Cuba is the last remaining communist country. I, I wish that were true, but unfortunately, there are a number of other uh, avowed communist countries. I mean, China, I guess people argue, oh, China isn't communist anymore because they got private industry over there. Well, uh, I actually would say that China is. It's, it's, uh, they, it, uh, they certainly consider themselves ch uh, communist. Or so. But if, if China's too, if China's too laissez-faire for you, there's always North Korea. There's there's Laos. There's Vietnam. So that's their other communist countries. Um, now you also said that most uh, people in Cuba are glad that Castro replaced Batista. Well, uh, I've talked to a number of Cubans, and I can tell you that I have not met a single one that thinks Cuba is better off under under old man Fidel. Uh, and, um, and, and, and I'm not, now, the number of people who have left Cuba and come to the United States is enormous. It's about 10, 15 percent of Cuba's population has, uh, has left the country uh, since 1959. Now let me, one fool at a time, Sid, um, now, and that's not just, and, and the emigration out of Cuba is, is much greater now uh, and in the last 50 years than it was before 1959. And, and that ought to tell you something right there. And it isn't just rich people that fled the country in 59 because the emigration out of Cuba has kept on going and going and going. And so there's a, sometimes you get a big spike like when the Mariolitos uh, uh, left in 1980. Uh, but, but there's been this steady flow of people leaving Cuba, which, and it's actually quite difficult. They have to sneak out like escaping from prison. Uh, and now, I also, now the other thing, as for this embargo on Cuba, a lot of times you'll hear that the that you'll, people will blame the United States embargo for all of Cuba's troubles. And that is really not very true. The embargo has not had much of an impact, as you saw from Peter's presentation. Cuba's trading with all kinds of other countries, just not the United States. Okay, but lots of other countries in the world trade with Cuba. The fact of the matter is, that, that the, the, the Castros, Fidel and Raul, have dreadfully mismanaged the country. Uh, Cuba now has to actually, Cuba was once a country that, that exported food, and now they have to import most of their food. Uh, the sugar crop has collapsed there. They used to be one of the world's leading exporters of sugar. They no longer are. Uh, and uh, uh, the people, the standard of living of the people, I mean, yeah, they get free medical care, the amount of food they're allowed, and the general standard of living keeps going down, 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 uh, year by year, decade by decade. So uh, even by their own standards of lifting up the standard of living of the people, they fail, okay? Now, um, and, and it isn't comparable to a country like Guatemala, which is agrarian. Cuba had a much higher standard of living before the revolution, before Castro, and uh, it's really much more comparable to, uh, to a better off Latin American country like Puerto Rico. And, and if you look, if you compare Cuba and Puerto Rico, you can see Puerto Rico is way better off than Cuba. Now, um, the, the other thing I would just say is that, um, as for the omnipotence of the American empire, I would just say, a first of all, a couple of things. The Bay of Pigs invasion, you know, it would, uh, Mike, the Bay of Pigs invasion did not fail because Kennedy on purpose sold out uh, the um, the Cuban exiles, the Bay of Pigs the Bay of Pigs was invasion was was a serious operation, but it failed because of total U.S. government incompetence, which demonstrates that even the most powerful empire that's ever existed in the world can still screw up. And second, it also um, and 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 on the, in a larger sense, the the you know the American empire that you all are so terrified of is is really uh, very much in decline now. Um, the only, as I understand it, the only South American countries uh, that left that are still, at one time, every country in South America was an ally of the U.S. That was true in World War II. At the present time, the only countries left that are still allies, I believe, are Colombia and Peru. And the only countries left in the Caribbean that are still allies of the U.S. are, are uh, Dominican Republic and I think maybe Haiti. That's, that's it. And Haiti, by the way, the U.S. had to, uh, had to overthrow Aristide and, ins and, and install a puppet government in order to have them as an ally. So we don't really have the support of the Haitians. Um, and so, so finally, um, so in any case, there's the, this, this, whole, this whole thing has been, has been a complete failure. I, but however, let me just say, I, you know, part of the problem is this idea of the government running everything, running the whole economy. It doesn't work. I mean, you can say what you, you know. It, it just doesn't work. And uh, I actually prefer I actually prefer a free enterprise system. 
And so for that reason, I actually am in favor of lifting the embargo on Cuba, because then once, once they start trading with the United States, then, they'll, uh, then people in Cuba will, will see how good we have it over here, and, uh, and they'll start campaigning uh, for real change in Cuba. Okay. <laughs> called a cell phone. That would not be around today. I give you this projector, less than $300. And it may be made in China. It may be made in China, but it's also cheaper to ship worldwide. Thank you, globalization. Thank you, worldwide prosperity. Thank you, United States, for maintaining the sea lanes open and keeping the world in a general prosperous condition. Thank you, United States, for keeping the sea lanes open and keeping the trade and goods flowing around the world. Thank you, United States, for exerting that political power that keeps these other, that keeps these schmuck, schmucky dictatorships from really losing their, their way. What do I like about the United States? First of all, let's take a look at about a week ago, and let's take a look at what's happening in Cuba. For almost 70 years, you've had one family rule, a dictatorship. And any time you have a dictatorship in a state-run economy, of course you're going to go downhill. You look at just last week, even though many of you might not think about it, we had a peaceful election, a peaceful transition of power. And even if that peaceful transition of power may have been mucked up through vote counting, we have a court system, lawyers, and a whole bunch of people that are going to ensure some kind of peaceful transition of power. You're not going to have blood in the streets and guns running just for a change of government. The next thing I want to tell you about is, would I prefer to be in Cuba now? Because if we were in Cuba today, I don't think we could run this College of Complexes nope. assembly. No way. Of course you could. And I don't think we could run a lot of other things. Now, I'm not going to say that the Cuban Revolution didn't produce some good things, like free medical care for all, or maybe a stipend around the government. Perhaps maybe we could use some of those ideas in the reforms of our own system. Because yes, there has been a decline in the American working living standards over the last 30 years because of the rise of corporate influence and power in the United States. Have we been through this before? Yes, you betcha. It's called 1917, just before Theodore Roosevelt got into office. We elected a progressive agenda, we unionized, and we were able to take back some of our, and increase our standards of working rights. Yes, do I believe in unions? Yes, I do. Yes, do I believe in the American free enterprise system? Yes, I do. Yet, do I believe in the American governmental system? Yes, I do. It's all about countervailing power. It's all about the balance of what goes on from one to another. And yes, I believe that the world is moving forward, and I believe that capitalism and free enterprise and even the rise of the unions would be a good thing. If a lot of these unions are really concerned about their fellow workers, why aren't they organizing in Laos? Why aren't they organizing in Cambodia? Why aren't they organizing in China? I give you, my friends, if you want to fight a global corporation, you have to have a global union. Now, I give you my country, which I still think is the best form of government in the world, or to maybe quote it, democracy is one of the worst forms of government, except for all the else, everything else. Maybe perhaps we could look at capitalism the same way. Capitalism is the worst form of economic development, except for all the rest. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, let's see. You know, uh, Burnery 
very tall and... Uh, Use the microphone. Yeah. Puerto Rico and uh, Cuba are somewhat analogous uh, entities. Uh, they, you know, similar populations, uh, similar uh, products. Uh, they they uh, don't grow as much tobacco in Cuba, in, in Puerto Rico, as uh, they did in Cuba. But they do grow tobacco and sugar, and produce a lot of rum. Um, well, and where are the majority of Puerto Ricans today? In the United States, not in Puerto Rico. <laughs> well, it's not a, a new story. Where do people go? They go for jobs. They go for uh, opportunities. And those are in the industrialized country. Why? Why, did, uh, why do, do countries uh, become communist or socialist or adopt uh, uh, government uh, uh, nationalization of uh, their uh, copper or their resources, resources their, their oil or whatever, it's because they need to industrialize. They have to compete in a world market. And uh, the, the, uh, the Bolsheviks uh, provided one a way of, of doing that. Uh, it was uh, nationalism. It was the na nation state uh, became, in, in this case, uh, the Russian Empire. It wasn't a national, well, it was Russian, but uh, it, there were so many populations there. Uh, different uh, Turkish and uh, uh, different ethnic uh, groups entirely, uh, Caucasians, Poles, uh, 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 whatever. Uh, but they they were incorporated in the Russian Empire. It was state capitalism. They did, tried to develop a state capitalism, and they did. They industrialized. Uh, well, when it comes to... Uh, and it was the only way they could compete with the... Uh, with the West. Uh, what do we have today in Cuba? We have a state that has been truncated in its industrial development because of the antipathy of the U.S. state. Uh, the embargo uh, analogous to the sanctions that are currently being imposed on uh, Iran and have been imposed. Uh, the United States throws its economic weight around. Uh, 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 Haiti is perhaps the poorest country in the world, and for uh, when Aristide was uh, president, they when we imposed a uh, uh, sanctions on them. Uh, he even. You know, it, it's brutal. It's brutal. The, the sanctions that were imposed on Iraq destroyed the Iraqi economy. We're, we're currently destroying the uh, Iranian economy. Uh, their societies will. Uh, 
uh, bear the marks of the, that for generations. What? And yet, you see resistance and you see. Uh, no. Time is up. Well, my time is up, yes. <laughs> Okay, well, I just uh, I'd like to thank Peter for a great presentation, quite enjoyable. Uh, moment here to, uh, to reflect on the election. Uh, 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 something I picked up from Jay Leno. He said it was you know the bright side about Romney losing was that he didn't have to move into a smaller house. <laughs> and I guess I hate to say I told you so, you guys, but. I did tell you so. I did tell you that all this, uh, you know, your campaigns against Citizens United were all for naught. I told you, I asked many of you guys in here, I said, if, you know, if they spent a billion dollars trying to get you to vote for Romney, would you do it? And they would say no. I said, I wonder if they spent a trillion. And they would say, I would say, they would say no, I still would vote. I go, see, I rest my case. And uh, so again, uh, trying to, you know, have more government control over our freedoms of speech and all that would have uh, got you uh, exactly nowhere. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see about Cuba. Well, there's all, all kinds of things I could Tim, say about Cuba, I guess. I've never been there myself, but I've got uh, friends that have been there, Some one friend that's been there about five times. Sid, uh, the reason that Cuba is so bad off. It's not because that they don't have resources or things like that. They're advanced. If you compare Cuba with Hong Kong, you know Hong Kong was a rock in the water. They, they had they had nothing either. They used to be a fishing village until the uh, when the British came. The governor or whoever ran uh, Hong Kong said, "Well, we're basically going to take a hands-off approach." We're going to allow the people to have private property, and then we're going to keep away from them. Let them let them do things that are on their own. We'll just provide police and courts, and basically the free market prevailed. And look at Hong Kong. Look at the economic powerhouse that they become. What do they have? Seven million people population or something. That's mine. There's a little rock. And these skyscrapers, this high standard of living, and all the the, the, the trade. I mean, it's just. It's a virtual, you know, hub of of finance and trade, you know, uh, for Asia. It's, it's you know, it's like a miracle story. And what that is, pure laissez-faire capitalism, allowing people uh, to uh, make decisions based on their own best self-interest, and allowing free trade, and you know, the division of labor, things that Adam Smith all all laid out. Now, we just finished reading the Communist Manifesto in the Political Economy Book Club. And of the ten planks of the Communist Party, most of them were, were wrong. The first one he got right was, you know, the, the ground rent or the, all land should be held in common by the, the, by the government. And then the, the rent, instead of being appropriated in the private, you know, landlord's pockets should be uh, given to the state in this form as like, like, like taxes. Uh, and now that party got right, but every, almost everything else was wrong. And one thing he was really against, it wasn't one of the planks, but that other reading in the book, he was really against free trade. You know, he really thought that was ex exploitation. But you know, if you're going to make something like a pencil or a pin, imagine if you didn't have people to trade with, you wanted to make pins. You'd have to, you'd have to go out and uh, dig yourself some iron ore, and you'd have to make yourself a blast furnace, you know, and make your make your own steel, and then you'd have to hammer it yourself, you know, and draw it out, and chrome plane it, and you know, sharpen it. You have to make a machine to sharpen it. You'd be doing all this stuff. You would probably not be able to make a box of pins in your lifetime. But instead, you can go to Walmart and buy a whole box of pins for forty nine cents. Not Walmart. And, and you could get them in, you know, in, you know, in, you know, in a few minutes. It's because of it's because of free trade. You know, it's you got somebody's 
I'm just making each individual part, just like pencils. You, know, you, could grow, you could buy a florist and grow a tree and cut it down and plane it and then you get some wood and some graphite, you know, buy a, buy a rubber plantation. You could do all that, but think you, you, yeah, you'd spend your whole lifetime, you'd probably never produce one pencil. But we just go out and buy well, the rubber, the wood, the graphite, you know, and put it together and you can make a pencil. And that's, it's that cooperation, you know, that's, that's what, you know, that's what works. And you know what, and people are, were willing to die for that from Cuba and there's, you know, a lot of people did die trying to come over here uh, to get away from Cuba just so they could have, uh, you know, those, those opportunities, those freedoms. And I've been in Florida a number of times, a number of times, and I've been in Ybor City, which is largely Cuban. I've been, you know, in Tampa and Key West. And I've been in, you know, I've seen, you know, uh, small entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, you know, Cuban guys pull up to the restaurant in, you know, uh, Jaguar convertibles, you know, and dress to the nines. They're very high, but they're really, really the, the big miracle story in their immigrants. The, the Cubans have done really well. In Florida, I mean, there's the guys that really come over here and you know, work, put their nose to the grindstone, and take advantage of the freedoms we have, have really, really uh, uh, done well for themselves. Now, uh, my friends that have been down there when they've come back, they've told me that the people down there are hungry, they're starving. He said, if you go down there, you know, bring a bunch of extra uh, energy bars with you, you know, like bicycle suits, so you can give them to the people. He says, you know, they're hungry. This, this rationing and all that, you know, it doesn't work. And it's, it's not only, socialism has not only been a failure there in Cuba, but like Tim said, it's also a failure everywhere else it's been tried, uh, including the uh, 72 years that it was, that it was in Russia. But uh, we know, you know, we know what works. And yeah, we have some problems, but with capitalism. But there's you know, there's nothing that uh, like somebody else said. There's uh, or you're sorry, taking my thunder when I come in late is the problem. But uh, there's no you know. So far though, I mean, it's it's not perfect, but it's it's the best thing uh, that we've got so far. And by the way, our uh, the next political economy book club selection is the menace of privilege which was written by Henry George Jr., Henry <laughs> George's son, in 1905. And it's available for free download on the internet all over the place. You can go to archive.org, download it for uh, Kindle and other formats. And uh, we'll have our first, uh, we're going to actually split that one up. It's about 400 and some pages. So we're going to split it up into two halves. We're going to read, they call them books. There's like five, five books with five big chapters. We're going to read the first uh, five or six, I think it's up to page uh, 226. I think it's book one through book six. When's the uh, next meeting? It, it'll be sometime in January. When they make a new schedule, they'll tell me. I'm trying to get it late in late January. Uh, so we'll cover the first half, you know, which is like the first 226 pages. And then our second meeting will be in March, and we'll cover the last half, which is about 186 pages. But uh, I, I, I just, I've read a, a, you know, a few pieces and parts here and there. It looks, uh, looks quite good. And it was the uh, uh, inspiration for Chuck Metalitz's blog on the internet called The Menace of Privilege. You can go look at the, Men the Menace of Privilege blog, and uh, there's actually he has a lot of good reading and commentary out there. And because what we're talking about, pri what privilege is, you know, it's like so there's, there's a difference between creating wealth and just appropriating wealth. And privilege is what lets people appropriate appropriate wealth. So, for instance, being a landowner is a privilege. You know, you don't have to work, but just that privilege of having that piece of paper, it's like a government license, it gives you exclusive ownership to a particular tract of land, let's say on uh, 600 North Michigan Avenue or something. And imagine the money you can squeeze out of the people that want to use that land to live, work, and play. In Chicago, you can really take them by the fucking ball and squeeze the fuck out of them. <laughs> Tens of thousands a month, and you're not doing any labor at all. All you got is a little piece of paper that says, I own that, and because I got this piece of paper, you have to pay me. Because maybe my great great uncle bought it in 1832 for a thousand bucks. Now it's worth 150 million, 
you know, I can soak, I can squeeze out of you tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands a month in rent, which all goes into HIP National Bank. And the people that have to that pay that, they also have to pay taxes to the government to run the country. But wouldn't it be a much better idea if instead of paying everybody paying taxes, if that rent went, you know, the part that went for the land, which is most of the money they're squeezing out of it, if that went to the government instead of you having to pay taxes, and that you only had to pay rent for the maintenance and upkeep and the you know capital costs of the building. So that's a so that's a privilege. I think. Having a taxi cab badge is a privilege. You know, it's a it's a government created and controlled monopoly. You hear that, Bernie? Am I out of time yet, Ron? Yeah, Bernie, you're at oh, his time. Is time on on his time's yeah. been up for a while. <laughs> <laughs> your, your time's been up. You've been almost seven minutes. Oh, okay. No. Been Too much privilege. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you repeat the same shit um, over and over and it becomes the uh, truth. Who said that? <laughs> First of all, I too would like to say something about the recent election. I noticed with some amusement that the folks over in Hoosier land, uh, <laughs> they turned out a perfectly respectable Hoosier. senator by the name of Dick Luger. I didn't always agree with Senator Luger, but he was a moderate and one could do business with him. So they threw him out, and they put in some Tea Party clown named Murdoch. And when the general election time came around, it turned out that the general election, which I have no doubt that Senator Luger would have won quite easily, well, they threw him out, and they put in Murdoch, and he lost. And the Democrats are going to pick up that seat in, in November, yes. or in January. And I think that's, that's doing pretty well for, for Hoosier land. Uh, apparently, not all of them choose to live in the era of Benjamin Harrison and William McKinley, women. and that not all of them choose to be preoccupied with the poetry of James Whitcomb Riley. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many with regard to how President Kennedy wound up with so many Cuban cigars, it's quite simple. Before he became president, uh, before the Eisenhower administration and its waning weeks broke our relations with Cuba, President-elect had his tobacconist, the New York H. Upman and Company, uh, round up every Cuban cigar they could find and put it in his humanist private humidor. It's that simple. Uh, with regard to the comments that were made about the Bay of Pigs, that started in the Eisenhower administration, and it was begun by CIA Director Alan Dulles and his, and, and his number two Richard Bissell and the rest of the people who organized, and if I mispronounce the Spanish, forgive me, uh, La Brigada. And it failed for the simple reason that when they got to Cuba, they discovered that the Cubans were not interested in getting rid of Fidel Castro, period. And that they weren't going to rise, which is something that the planners of this invasion had been counting on. Uh, at that point, they asked President Kennedy for more help. The president realized that the only way to do it was to go to war with Russia. And he was, he to his credit, said no. That's, that's, it's that simple. And he took the spot, and while it was started during the Eisenhower administration, it came to fruition on his watch, and he accepted the responsibility for him, for giving his approval to it. And in fact, Alan Dulles was eased out as CIA director after that. Yes. The president reportedly said to him, under a parliamentary system, it would be I who would have to leave. Under our system, it is you who must go. <laughs> and finally, with regard to what I said about the missile sites, um, what, I would have, what I was getting at, Peter, was not whatever active installations Cuba uh, has going now for its defense. This is, after all, the 50th anniversary of the missile crisis. And I, all I was curious about was whether you had seen any of the formal missile site, former missile sites, which presumably now have all been deactivated and decommissioned. At least I would hope so. I would hope that there are no Soviet missiles still, still lurking around down there. Thank you. Cuban restaurant where I like to eat every so often. Well, it closes up eventually. I walk by it one day, and there's some Cubans in there talking. I mean, Cubans like to sit around all day and talk. 
And the owner of the restaurant went over to the liquor store next door and came back with a six pack of Coca Cola. I said, Oh, Jimmy Carter had just gotten uh, Coca Cola into China. And they thought that was funny Coca Cola in China. And uh, he said, Yeah, Nixon got uh, Pepsi into Russia. Yep. So, yeah, Republicans. Uh, well, Pepsi and Democrats, Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. This one Cuban guy says that this uh, Che Guevara went over to Russia about this time, sometime in the early 60s. And when he came back, he said, the soda pop over there is no good. And that's what they said we did Bolivia, where he got killed. Well, I don't know, maybe there's something to all this conspiracy talk. That's, uh, you know, no smoking guns, but uh, I do like that Cuban food. That's about the only food, food I've enjoyed most in uh, my adult life. But, uh, Sydney Webb, the Fabians. Yep. They wrote a very interesting little book a few years ago about how they were trying to thrust a big slice of Bismarckism into England and other countries in Europe. Bismarckism is basically the idea that everybody take that the government takes. Bismarck invented Social Security basically to buy off the discontented working class and make them identify with the government. And that's what uh, they tried to do in Italy and England and a few other places. And it seems like they succeeded. They succeeded real well here. You guys identify with the government? You know, all about, you don't like the war and the labor policies and so on, but you really identify with the government. No, no, no. no. All I'm going to say is, Viva la Revolucion, or Viva la Reagan Revolucion. Yes. Oh. Oh. Peter Perel. Peter Perel gets the last word. There's a lot of um, knowledge in this room, though, and a lot. Uh, even more time in Cuba than I spent. So I learned a lot. Thank you folks. Uh, I think it really boils down to, uh, gee, I had, yeah, utopia. Is it a utopia or a failed state? And uh, I think the answer came from some kids. They said, we like our country, they said, but our economy is broken. And uh, which way are we headed? And uh, I think if the U.S. is willing to compromise a bit now, maybe under a new administration, the Congress especially, because only the Congress can, can break the embargo. And if the Castros are willing to uh, recognize change, there may be some compromise in the uh, next five years ahead. And I hope so for the sake of both sides. So thanks for being here.